everyone. Welcome back to True Crime Buzz. I'm your host, Amber. Vanessa is back, as y'all have heard, but she is out this week. So with me today is Miss Brittany. Hello. Let me see that Diet Coke. There it is. <laughs> there it is, friend. I knew it. Oh, it's not even a Sam's Cola. That's a legit Diet Coke. Yes, my boo thing went to the store and got me a real Diet Coke today. Guess what I'm drinking? Rex Goliath. Rex Goliath. I sure am. Yay! In my cute little wine glass that my mom got me. I love that so much. I do too. So for Christmas, my mom got me these wine glasses off of Etsy. Raccoons are my most favorite thing in this whole world. And they have this raccoon on it holding a wine glass. And then underneath it, it says trashed. And I love it so much. Best gift ever. Mm -hmm. I applaud Barb for that so much. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm drinking some Pinot Grigio because they are still out of my Cabernet. But I saw the Pinot Grigio and I was like, I'm taking it. It'll it's do. better than nothing. Yeah. It'll do. It'll do. <laughs> so, did you read the news? <laughs> did I read the news? Yes, I've read the news. <laughs> As, hasn't everyone read the news? And we're not talking about the political shitstorm that was at the Capitol. We're not going to talk about that. No. This is not a political podcast. Technically, what happened was a true crime, but that's not what we're talking about today. No. <laughs> no, we're talking about the infamous serial killer, Samuel Little, dying. Whose body count was not so little. No. And I'm going to cover that next, so I'm so excited. And shout out to, what's your friend's name? Oh, Brienne Lyon. Yes. Shout out to Brienne for actually, I think you shared it or you did something. You're yeah. like, oh my God, Samuel Little died. Yeah, she messaged it to me. She's like so awesome though. Which good because he's rotting in hell now, but there's so many like unsolved people that we won't know for sure from now on whether he was the one or not. So yeah. that kind of sucks. But It does. But yeah, he died. So not RIP, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so... Today we are going to do another episode of Serial Killer OG, except this is the OG of OGs. Yes. So, this dude would forever be known as America's first serial killer, which is up for debate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But probably even more famous for his murder castle. Ooh. Does this sound familiar? <sighs> A little. A little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Probably because you love American Horror Story, just like I do. Did you watch the hotel season? No. That's the only season. <gasps> no, that's not the only season. I haven't watched that one or the one with the clown, because I don't like clowns. Best season, arguably. Gaga's in it, but also Evan Peters? Yes, Evan Peters. Mm -hmm. Okay. His character in that show is based on H.H. H. Holmes. Okay. So anyways, <laughs> this murder castle was a three-story hotel that he built from the ground up. Filled with kill rooms, gas chambers, dissecting tables, a death chute, and a body-sized furnace. What? He would confess to 27 murders, but was suspected of more than 200. Wow. Yeah, this dude was nuts. So this is the story of H.H. H. Holmes. And spoiler alert, that is not his real name, and it bothers me so much that we know him as H.H. H. Holmes today. Are you going to tell me why he's known as H.H. H. Holmes? I hope, because... Yes. So I'm going to preface all of this by saying that this man loved to stretch the truth. He loved to say things and then take them back. And he was very wishy-washy. He was the ultimate con man to the fullest. Mm. So much of what we know today about his life is based on memoirs that he's wrote and things that he has said. There's very few actual records. And even the actual records that we have, he has a lot of aliases. Okay. Like, he would change his name on every document he signed. So it's hard to really know for sure what happened other than the evidence that they found during his ongoing crimes. Okay. So, H.H. H. Holmes, as we know him today, was actually born Herman Webster Mudgett. So I can <laughs> see why he changed his name. <laughs> That's not a very scary serial killer name. No. But you know what's funny is Matt's great-grandma, well, it's not funny, but her name, they called her Grand Mudgett. Grand Mudget? That's so cute. Grand Mudget, yeah. So that kind of reminds me of that. Grand Mudget. So H.H. H. Holmes was actually Herman Webster Mudget. He was born on May 16th, 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. He was the youngest of three siblings. And his father, Levi, was a farmer. And his mother, Theodate, she was a stay-at-home mom, of course, because did women even work back then? No. And a devout Methodist. 
Oh. Based on his personal diary records, his parents, especially his father, were very strict and he hated them. When the Great Fire of Chicago happened, he liked to fantasize that his parents were burning alive in it. So, great, wow. great relationship. That's pretty rough. That's real rough. I've been real mad at my parents before. I've never thought about them dying a horrible death in any fashion. In a fire. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Mm-mm. So, during this time, modern science as we know it was just starting to take off. We were learning tons about the human body and how it worked. So, full body skeletons were usually hanging in the windows in front of pharmacies and doctor's offices. Like, people were just obsessed with anatomy and how the body worked because we were just starting to figure it out. Wow, that's crazy. It's a little but morbid, cool? but I like it. Yes, yeah, very yeah, cool. Yeah, no, it's cool. <laughs> so as a child, Holmes was actually terrified of these places because as a little kid, seeing all these skeletons in the windows, he was just terrified. Right. Which is understandable. Very. So one day, some local bullies forced him inside one of the pharmacies and put him face to face with one of these skeletons up close. And he documented in one of his diaries that that is the moment he became fascinated with death and he was only 11 years old. Gee, thanks, bullies. Yes. So he was terrified up until that point and he said he opened his eyes and all he saw was just, I'm talking face to face with like a skeleton. And he was just so fascinated by it that he spent the rest of his life. The PG version is he wanted to learn more, but how he learned more is what is an issue in this story. So <laughs> mm. unfortunately... After this, he started torturing and killing small animals. Mm. He would even keep parts of them, such as their skulls, their paws, their tails. He would basically just murder them to dissect them and, like, see what was on the inside. Okay, but see, this is one of those things where, since we live in the South, I'm going to say that it's only creepy because he tortured them. Because, I mean, how many people you know that got deer skulls and deer heads hanging everywhere? Exactly. So, it's just the torture. <laughs> So at what point did he move from animals to humans? Confirmed kills didn't officially start until he was an adult. However, there are a couple weird situations that happened around him when he was a child that make people question if he started much earlier. Oh. The first one being his childhood best friend's name was Tom. He died while they were playing in an abandoned house and he fell, I'm not sure if he fell downstairs or off a balcony, but he fell and died. And when everyone would ask him, like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry your friend died. How do you feel? He replied, quote, I'd rather be alone. Okay. Um, okay, then. <laughs> also in 1879, his cousin Mary was found in the local river, what they assumed was a drowning. Hmm. But some speculate that Holmes had something to do with it. There's no evidence or anything pointing to it other than it was his cousin. He lived in the same area. He's a wackadoo. Maybe he drowned her. Yeah, but I'm definitely counting him for Tom. Tom sounds a little suspicious. It does. But anyways, so he graduated high school at just 16. This dude was so smart. Like, I cannot express how smart he was. That's the only good thing I have to say about him. And apparently he was charming and all that, but like, what serial killer isn't? <laughs> yeah, I feel like those are the two qualities. You have to be smart and you have to be charming mm -hmm. in order to be a serial killer. Correct. And he was a huge ladies man. Huge ladies man, which we will get into later. But his first wife, her name was Clara Lovering, and they got married in July 1878. Aww. This story gets a little crazy, so just stay with me. So at this point, he's in New Hampshire where he grew up. Okay. Meets Clara, gets married. Then in spring of 1882, he moves to Vermont to enroll in medical school at the University of Vermont. Clara stays behind in New Hampshire, which is weird, but, you know, different times, whatever. For some reason, the next semester, in the fall of 1882, he transfers to the University of Michigan, and that's where his criminal life officially begins. So he's already moving all over the place. As I mentioned earlier, this time period was when medical science was really starting to take off, so medical schools would literally pay people for cadavers, like as many as they could get, because there was a lot of dissecting going on. But they would pay people for them. So a huge thing back in the late 1800s was grave robbing. People would dig up graves and sell the skeletons to medical schools. Here I thought people were just grave robbing for jewelry. I mean, they did that too. But, you know, you got a skeleton afterwards. You're like, all right, well, let me make a couple bucks off this and sell it to this medical school. Good gravy. Or the pharmacy to hang up in their window. Why not? <laughs> skeletons. New fall decor. Halloween year round. I'm here for mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Yeah. 
So Holmes and another medical student who I couldn't find their name came up with an insurance fraud scheme where they would actually steal cadavers from their school or the graveyards, take out life insurance policies on each other, and turn that body in as themselves to cash in on the life insurance policy. What? Yes. The fuck. Okay. And you're thinking, like, how are you going to turn in this dead body that looks nothing like yourself? But there was, like, no records back then. There was right, no DNA. Right. There was no fingerprinting. There was nothing. So it was literally just, like, your word, and you could just handwrite on a piece of paper who you think you are, and they'll take it. So wow. they could continue to take out life insurance policies multiple times. They would just cash it out and be like, all right, here you go. And this is how he paid for his medical school. Okay. Some people strip, some people sell skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta pay them bills. That's right. He did end up graduating at the University of Michigan, and then he moved to Chicago, again leaving his wife behind, in early 1886 and became a pharmacist under the name Harry H. Holmes. So this is the first instance of H.H. H. Holmes being used. Okay. And this is one of many, again, that he would use throughout his whole life. He worked at a local pharmacy in the Inglewood area of Chicago, which was owned by an older couple, the Holtons. It was mainly ran by the wife because her husband was sick with cancer. Mm -hmm. And so when the husband finally died, Holmes offered to help out, being the sweetheart that he is, and said, let me buy the pharmacy from you and I'll just make payments to you. That way you don't have to worry about this burden of owning a pharmacy on your own without your husband. Ugh. Yeah. She accepted. All the while... He takes ownership of this pharmacy and then takes out loans against the pharmacy and doesn't pay them back and does not pay her back. Oh. Uh. So he starts taking out like credit loans against the pharmacy for the supplies, but then not paying them. So he's literally just pocketing everything that he earns. What a douchebag. Everything that he gets, he doesn't earn. <laughs> so the wife suddenly disappears shortly thereafter. And when asked where she went, he would reply, oh, after her husband died, she decided to visit California and go see her family for a little while. But then these same customers later on would be like, all right, it's been a little while. Where's she at? And he would say, oh, she liked it so much, she just decided to move there. Okay. So another unconfirmed kill that we can easily suspect that he probably had something to do with. Most certainly. So now with all this money that he has, he decides to purchase the lot literally right across the street from this pharmacy. And this is where the infamous future murder house will be. It's located at the southwest corner of 63rd Street and Wallace Street in Chicago. He bought the lot in December of 1886 and it officially opened in September of 1889. Mm. So this murder house was actually more of a hotel. Chicago was considered a boom town during this time. It was a big city. It was home to the first skyscraper. You know, it was on the up and up. The World's Fair was getting ready to happen in a few years. Okay. So he knew a lot of people were going to be visiting Chicago. Let me build a hotel. Right. So the World's Fair would last for six months and an estimated total of over 27 million people from all over the world would attend. Holy chicken and biscuits, I'm telling you. The hotel was built from the ground up. The final blueprints would remain completely secret and only Holmes would know them. He would contract work out on the house to pretty much anyone that wanted work. But he would only instruct them very small sections per person. Like, hey, rather than building this whole floor, you're going to build the left side of this bedroom over here. And you're going to go over here and do the steps. And you're going to go over here and do one third of the hallway. And then once they would finish that part, he would fire them for their shitty work oh and not gosh. pay them. Of course not. So this hotel was built for free. How nice. And that way nobody knew what his master plan was. They just knew we were building this small section and then he would fire them. So what did this final murder castle turn out to be? The first floor was restaurants, shops, a jewelry store, a barber shop, and yes, even a pharmacy. Did it have skeletons hanging? Absolutely. Fresh every day. Skeleton of the day, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> the second floor contained 35 rooms with 51 doors. And yes, those numbers don't match for a reason. Six hallways. The rooms were lined with steel walls and asbestos. And that was to make them completely soundproof. And each room contained small gas vents. Okay. 
the walls had hidden panels that would lead to secret passageways, and there was a death chute that led to the basement for disposal of the bodies. Wow. That's really organized. Oh, there's blueprints of oh, the house, yes. and I'm going to post them. Yes. It's, it's awesome. And then the third and top floor had super narrow, dim-lit hallways that were in a maze form, and they would lead to dead ends. There would be stairs that led to nowhere, doors that opened to brick walls, and the doors for all the rooms locked only from the outside. Whoa. The third floor also contained his bedroom and his office where he had all the controls for these gas pipes leading into these rooms to murder people. Okay. And the best part of this house was the basement. This is where the death chute would drop the dead bodies. And that's where Holmes would dismember and dissect them on his operating tables. When he was done with them, he would either dissolve them in acid, cover them in quicklime, or he would burn them in his furnace which he claimed was for glass bending. Okay. But it was eight foot long and three foot wide. So what do you think it was for? <laughs> it's definitely for bodies. Definitely for bodies. Arguably his favorite part of this house was this steel vault that he had. So it was a room, but it had a glass wall so that Holmes could watch his victims die, either by asphyxiation or toxic gas that he put through those vents. Holy mackerel. Okay. He would also perform illegal abortions. And had a torture rack that he called Elasticity Determinator. This is where he attempted to stretch people out to two times their size. And he said he had dreams of creating, quote, a new race of giants. This dude is insane. He's insane. He's not okay in the head. He's like a mad scientist, but like took it way too fucking far. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Also, did I mention that medical schools needed cadavers? I think yes. I did. <laughs> several times anyways so he would continue during all this to sell his victims bodies as either cadavers or the full body skeletons to the medical schools and the pharmacies so back then a skeleton would sell for about two hundred dollars which is about six grand in today's money wow yes Mm-hmm. he was making that money he was by killing people which we don't condone i'm just saying no hustle in ways that don't take lives <laughs> It should be like a bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah, it should. And he still continued to perform life insurance fraud with any others that he basically didn't sell or dissolve in the acid. So he was literally living his best life. Yeah. He had everything. He was doing his, I guess, his dream job, you could say, and making so much money. It's insane. So in the early stages of construction of this hotel, he met and married his second wife, Murda Belknap. Wait, when did he divorce Clara? He didn't. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he was still technically married to his first wife. So he married her in January of 1887, and she came from a very wealthy family. So, of course, she helped fund the construction of this murder castle. Mm -hmm. She became pregnant by Holmes within the first year of marriage, and they had a daughter together named Lucy. But what's sad is he kept this family a secret, or as secret as he could, and he demanded that his wife and his child stay hidden on the top floor away from public eye. I don't know why he did that, but he didn't want anybody to know about his family. Maybe he didn't want to involve them in his murderous ways. Maybe. She did make it out alive, so maybe he did truly care for her. Perhaps. He also sold the previous pharmacy he was working at, the one across the street, to a man but literally, as soon as he sold it to him, that night, he took all the fixtures and the signs down and opened it up in his new pharmacy in the hotel right across the street. <laughs> what? Isn't that such a douche move? That is a really big douche move. Oh, you want to buy my pharmacy? Cool. And then he takes all of his pharmacy stuff out of it. So the guy literally just bought a building, an empty building. Ugh. Con man to the fullest. I'm telling you. So what does a good con man need? A good right-hand man. So in the fall of 1889, he met and hired his new best friend slash right-hand man, Benjamin Peitzel, who unfortunately was a very desperate alcoholic and had a large family. He needed that money. So he would do whatever Holmes told him to. He would run random errands. He would keep his secrets, all that. So while on an errand, Peitzel met a couple named Julia and Ned and introduced them to Holmes. And Holmes thought Julia was just so beautiful. He is still married to technically two women at this point. Delicious. So Holmes hires her. Actually, he hires both of them. 
Holmes hires Ned to work at the jewelry store in his new hotel and hires Julia to work closer with him and away from her husband as his personal bookkeeper. As you may guess, a secret love affair ensues between Holmes and Julia. No. I know, right? <laughs> now, Julia already had a daughter with Ned, her husband, a six-year-old named Pearl. But guess what? She gets pregnant by Holmes. Poor, poor Julia. And she actually wanted to leave her husband and be with Holmes, start this new family. And so she lets him know, like, hey, I'm over Ned. We have this new child coming. Let's be a family. And he promises her that he will marry her, but only if she has an abortion and only if he is the one that gets to perform it. What? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Not only, like, you must have an abortion but I saying gotta all do that, it. but I got to do it. I got to be the one. And just knowing what a douche and a con man this guy is, I already see through what he's trying to do. Oh, yeah, 100%. I know where this is going. So she agrees. And on Christmas Eve of all days in 1891, he chloroforms her until she overdoses on the chloroform and dies. He then flays her body, did some further exploratory dissection, and then sells her skeleton to a local pharmacy for display. Wow. They were documented as saying something about her because she was actually like six feet tall. You can tell a, a woman and a man's skeleton apart. And so they just thought, oh my God, this is the most beautiful female skeleton we've ever seen. Wow. Isn't that That's so cold. fucking sad? Yeah. That's so cold. Well, he had a problem and that was his way of fixing it. Evidently. And what's even further, and I'm so sorry, Brittany. He thought, well, I can't leave Pearl without a mom. So he kills her too. Ah! I know, no. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't have details for your sake. I didn't want them either way. Thank you. But they did find her body buried in the basement of the hotel years later when they do a search. Okay, but where was Dad in all this? Ned? Yeah, I guess Ned? he was busy selling jewelry, I don't know. He's not like, oh, where's my wife? Where's my child? Like... He probably made up some shit like, oh, she ran off with some other dude and they're starting a family in California with the rest of them. I don't know. That's all I got on the family. <laughs> all his victims ran to California. It's always California. <laughs> so about a year later, Peitzel plays matchmaker yet again and introduces Holmes to a woman named Emmeline Sigran. Holmes found her very attractive too and hired her as his personal secretary. Mm -hmm. And after just a few months... He asked her to marry him in November of 1892. <laughs> Dude, what? He's already married to two other women. <laughs> and one of them's on the third floor. Living and upstairs. one of them's on the third floor hiding away from public. Yeah. It was in her best interest, obviously, that she did. Dude, it really was. Like, she didn't realize how good she was actually getting it in the end. That's a fact. But of course, this woman would never make it to the altar. Once they decided, yes, let's get married, he gave her a bunch of envelopes so that she could address them to her friends and family to let them know the good news. But he told her to address them as the last name of Howard instead of Holmes, which I was like, what? But hear me out. This dude is so smart. He could have really went places if he didn't have such an evil demon living inside of him. If he didn't have those murderous tendencies. So he said, make sure you put Howard instead of Holmes. And, of course, she was like, why would I do that? And he said, well, I'm actually related to a duke in England. He had an inheritance with that duke, but it was under the family name, which was Howard, not Holmes. And he wouldn't get that inheritance if it was under his actual name, Holmes. So he said, just go with it. We're going to get a huge, big inheritance because of this. So she addresses all these letters to her friends and family saying she's going to marry some man with the last name of Howard. Shortly after the announcements were mailed out, he decided to lock her in the steel vault room that I described earlier. And while she was screaming and dying, he, quote, masturbated. Wow. That is sick. And then, of course, once she died, he sold her body to another medical school. This guy. And because he had her address them out as the future Mrs. Howard and not the future Mrs. Holmes, her family never suspected a thing because they thought she married some man named Howard and they just eloped and moved away. How smart is that? Right. So then the World's Fair in 1893 happened and it brought tons of guests to the murder hotel. So who knows just how many would end up being victims of H.H. H. Holmes? I mean, that's a lot. Yeah. But there are only two confirmed murders. 
that seems not enough. Oh, no. There was plenty more. but <laughs> Definitely you know, had to be more. Because he was so charming and charismatic and apparently good-looking and all this stuff. So people never suspected a thing out of this guy. But the two that were confirmed were sisters, Minnie and Nanny Williams. They were visiting from Texas. And Holmes learned that they were actually heiresses to a family fortune of $3.5 million in today's money. Wow. So he saw dollar signs. Of course he did. So he escorted them to the World's Fair every day for a week. Became very friendly with them, gained their trust, and apparently even like hooked up with, I think, both of them. But he would end up suffocating them one by one in that steel vault at the hotel. Wow. Okay. Now, obviously, he wouldn't get their fortune because he didn't marry them. He didn't have anything to do with them. So now that they're dead, I mean, he's not going to get a fortune. But somehow, he did seize the opportunity to take ownership of some land that they had in Fort Worth, Texas. And so he decided to move there after the World's Fair ended. Before he moved there, he met and married his third and final wife, Georgiana Yoke. Again, never divorced either of his previous wives. And they moved to Fort Worth, her, Holmes, and Peitzel. You know, he wouldn't move without his best friend. No. And they moved there in 1894. While in Texas, Holmes and Peitzel switched things up a little bit and attempted to do a horse scam rather than life insurance fraud. I tried to find some information on that because I'm like, how? what's a horse scam? But I guess they stole horses and tried to resell them. Probably so. But they were caught, and so they fled to St. Louis, of all places, about six months later. Men on the run. While in St. Louis, Holmes was eventually arrested for credit fraud, because what crimes doesn't this man commit with a local pharmacy there, and was actually sentenced to jail for the very first time. Well, finally. And this is the beginning of the end for Holmes. His ego will finally get the best of him, because while Holmes was in jail awaiting bond, he met his sailmate, whose name was Marion Hedgepeth, a.k.a. the Handsome Bandit. Okay. And meeting someone who was like a notorious criminal, they decided to have a pissing contest and were exchanging their own crime stories. Like, oh, well, I did this. Oh, well, I did this. You know what I mean? <sighs> the stupidity of that. To That's be so, so smart, you made a real dumb mistake. Well, his ego. He is smart. His ego, his yeah. His ego, you know? Mm -hmm. So before being released on bond... Holmes told this handsome bandit about his plans for a future life insurance scheme that he was going to do involving his best friend, Peitzel. He said that basically he was going to have Peitzel fake his own death for an insurance policy. And he offered this handsome bandit $500 of that money if he could give him a good crooked lawyer to help him out, get him out of jail. And so he's like, all right, you need to seek out this lawyer named Jephthah Howe. But in true Holmes fashion, once he made bail, he moved far away, Philadelphia to be exact, and never paid Marion the $500 for his help. This was also a huge mistake. Oh. So while in Philadelphia, he talked Peitzel into this life insurance scheme of faking his own death and took out a huge life insurance policy on him, which was $10,000 back then. I don't know what that would be nowadays, but that's a lot of money. Yeah, it sure is. And told him, you know, fake your own death. Once I get this life insurance plan, we'll split the money. But he actually kills him instead. He chloroforms him to death and burns his body. Oh. Of course, after taking out this life insurance policy. You well, know, he's going to get his money, but he actually kills him rather than him faking it. Man, he was cold. Like, that was his best friend. That man helped him with everything. I know, but I guess he saw, you know what, I don't have a real use for you right now, so you know too much. Bye bye It's a miracle that his wives and his mm -hmm. child survived any of being around him. For real. So two months later, Peitzel's burned body was found at a random location. I don't really know where. I read different things in different places, so I'm not sure where. But his burned body turned up, and from what I understand, Holmes burned him but left a pipe in his mouth and left him near a furnace or a some kind of gas thing to make it look like an accident. Basically make him look right. like he was lighting his pipe and it exploded. However, police aren't stupid. Well, some police aren't stupid. <laughs> and they noticed that he only suffered superficial burns, and if the place actually exploded, his body would be in pieces everywhere. But it wasn't. Right, of course. So they're like, all right, there's foul play here. When this event made the papers, old handsome bandit recognized the name 
and told the jail guard, hey, I know who did this. It's actually murder. That jail guard told the judge. So the Pinkerton Detective Agency found him in Boston and turned him into police. All right. Go Pinkertons. I know. And they actually arrested him on November 17th, 1894. So what was Holmes doing during all this time? All right, so this is where it gets weird, and I'm going to try to explain it as best I can, because this was a big part of the story where I'm like, wait, what? I mean, this whole story, I've been saying, wait, what? So, so he murders Peitzel. We know that. But then, basically, his wife and his family that he left back home, because you remember, that's the whole reason he worked yeah. with Holmes, was because he had a huge family to support. He told them he's still alive, but we did this insurance fraud scheme they think he's dead because I took out this huge life insurance policy of $10,000. I'll split it with you, but for right now, they're on my trail. We need to go into hiding. They're looking for your wife and your five children. If I take some of your children from you with me, you can easily say, well, I'm not her. I only have two children. Again, paperwork and shit back then was like not what it is now. So that's all you had to do to like pretend to be someone else. <laughs> So he told the wife, if I take some of your kids, they won't be looking for you? Yep. Okay. So he took three of her children, because they had five total, and basically went around the country with them. He already murdered Peitzel, so he thought, why not murder his children too? I honest to God just figured you were about to tell me he sold them, because everything this man did was for money or pleasure. So I didn't know which way it was going to go. I think at this point, he's realizing that they are hot on his trail, like his doom is coming very quickly, and so he is trying, trying to, to escape as best he can. Yes. So, he takes three of her children, Howard, Nellie, and Alice. Hmm. I know, I'm so sorry. I tried really hard to not, like, deal with this, but these are the only children, aside from Pearl, that he did this with. The first to go was Howard. He was, I think, 10 or 11. They went to Indianapolis, and he basically chopped up his body and burned him in an empty house in the wood stove. Okay. Then took the other two girls, Nellie and Alice, and went up to Toronto. Nellie and Alice, unfortunately, also died. I think Nellie was 11 and Alice was 15. But he locked them in a trunk. You know those old trunks that you used to travel with? Yeah. Like, yeah. So he put them in there, locked it, but then drilled a hole and put a hose into it and put toxic gas in there and murdered them that way. That's awful. Nellie's body was actually found later missing her feet, which were never found. And Holmes said that he did this post-mortem because she had club feet and he wanted to make it difficult for police to identify the body. This guy. so mm -hmm. Like, he is so smart, though. He's very methodical, for sure. After police arrested Holmes on the suspicion of Peitzel's murder, they obtained a search warrant for his home, a.k.a. the murder castle, and they found everything. Can you imagine? Can you imagine oh my finding God. all that? Dude, I tried because when I heard that, I'm like, oh, they're just going to this house thinking maybe we'll find something. And they walk right. in and it's literally a house full of torture chambers and acid baths and oh my God. Yeah. So he was officially convicted of only four murders, which would be Peitzel and his three children. Those are the only four he was officially convicted of, but that was enough. And he initially published a set of memoirs professing his innocence called Holmes' Own Story, which you can actually find online at the Library of Congress. That's pretty cool. Wow. But in this, he basically professes, I'm innocent, you have the wrong guy, but then also says this really creepy quote. He says, quote, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer no more than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into this world, and he has been with me ever since. End quote. <laughs> okay. That gives me like the fucking heebie-jeebies. <laughs> oh no, for sure. Like basically, I was born this way, and I'll never change, and I'm just pure evil. And he was. Most definitely he was. So after publishing this memoir, he would go back and forth, back and forth. I did it. No, I didn't. And then eventually he would admit to 27 murders, but only after making some change from it. Of he course. was paid $7,500 by the Hearst newspapers, which would be about a quarter million in today's money if he would just confess. And so he did. Of course he did. But what's weird is all of his statements were contradictory and he even redacted some of them right at the end. And even five of them where he said, yeah, I murdered them and this is how I did it, they found them alive. So it's like, how much of the truth do we even know about this man? 
So on May 7th, 1896, H.H. H. Holmes was hanged for his crimes at Moyamensing Prison in Philadelphia. However, some karma for this dude. He was hanged for his crimes. However, when he was hanged, his neck didn't immediately snap to kill him instantly. So he strangled to death and it took 15 minutes. Well, good. And then after being declared dead, they did bury him, but he had very specific requests for how he would be buried. And the judge actually honored them, which is shocking. Yeah. So he basically requested that he be buried in concrete. He wanted to be buried, I think it's 10 feet down instead of six or eight feet. Also in a double plot. So rather than one plot, he's like in the middle of two. So a big space. Okay. With an unmarked grave in a pine box covered with cement and then again covered in cement. And he said that basically he wanted to do this so that no one else would ever dig him up like he did his victims. <laughs> well, I wish somebody would have. I know, right? And his body now lies at Holy Cross Cemetery in Yeadon, Pennsylvania. Fun facts. So as you know, I watched this. I want to call it a horrible show and it's not. It's actually a really good show called American Ripper. So this man named Jeff Mudgett is actually the great-great-grandson of H.H. H. Holmes. But he spends his life, I think he wrote a book, I'm not sure, but I don't care because I can't stand him. Hmm. He spends his whole life swearing up and down that H.H. H. Holmes and Jack the Ripper are the same person. So there's a really good show on History Channel about them going through old documents and trying to prove his theory. So in early 2017... He actually requested to have H.H. H. Holmes' body exhumed to confirm that the remains were actually in the grave, first of all, but also that the remains in there were his because there was a theory that Holmes actually slipped out from the noose, put a fake body there. He paid off the executioner with a fake body and they buried some random dude and he escaped to South America. Which is kind of a cool theory to think about. Um, the whole Jack the Ripper theory is bullshit and I'll argue that all day long. So they did exhume his body, but once they finally got the body out, the anthropologist who performed the testing said that his clothes were almost perfectly preserved and his mustache was even intact. So he has a very prominent mustache, hmm. but the corpse was very decayed. And they said, once it gets to that point, you really can't do anything with it. So you can't test DNA. However, they did use his teeth and identified that was H.H. H. Holmes. Hmm. So he did not escape death and that was him. Well, good. And then the infamous murder castle. I remember trying to look this up like years ago on Google Maps because I was like, ooh, I want to see it. It's not there. Ugh. I know, I know. It no longer stands in Chicago. It was severely damaged by arson in 1895. So like a year before he was executed. And then it was completely demolished sometime in the 1930s. So now if you go on Google Maps and look up where it was, it's just a parking lot for the Inglewood Post Office. That's very disappointing. I know. Very. But yeah, that is the insane story of H.H. H. Holmes, or who should rather be called Herman Webster Mudgett. Yeah, we'll go and with that. And he's known as America's first serial killer. So, isn't that a crazy story? That's like one of the most insane stories I think I've ever heard in my life. Love our podcast? Then hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. We're also on Patreon head on over to patreon.com slash buzz and join us today for access to all of our exclusive content including bonus episodes you can also find us on facebook instagram and twitter at tc buzz podcast and last but not least you can check out our website at truecrimebuzz.com until next time cheers, cheers.